Welcome to part eight in the module that provides a case study of gang of four patterns. In other recent parts of the module, we presented a number of different patterns for our expression tree processing application. We started by exploring patterns for tree structure and access using the composite and bridge patterns. We then talked about patterns for tree creation. We talked about interpreter and builder. Then we described patterns for tree traversal, the iterator, prototype, and visitor patterns. And now we're going to talk about patterns for creating user operations, as well as being able to use those operations in stylized ways. The purpose of these patterns is to be able to define operations that users can perform on our expression tree processing application and centralize extensible creation of these particular operations. The patterns we'll be covering will be the command pattern. We'll also talk about the factory method pattern and a very closely related pattern called the abstract factory pattern. We're going to use these patterns to decouple the creation of various resources, such as commands, from their use, as well as to be able to provide a uniform API for creating various kinds of objects and operations and so on. Let's first start by talking about the problem. We want to be able to support various kinds of operations. We want to be able to support execution of user operations from, say, the command line or from some kind of user interface. For instance, when we're running in verbose mode, we want to be able to allow the users to set the format, which indicates what the order is that they'll be typing the expressions in. We want them to be able to provide the expressions as a string. We want them to be able to print the expressions in various traversal orders. We want them to be able to evaluate the expressions using various kinds of traversal orders. We want them to be able to quit the program, and so on and so forth. Those are some of the operations we want users to be able to provide. We also want to be able to provide so-called macro operations, which we use in succinct mode. Succinct mode is where you just get a very brief prompt and you type in an expression using in-order uh, syntax, and then you get the result back when you hit the return. So that's a different type of processing model. Some of the constraints and forces here, we don't want to have to scatter the various implementation details and various functions and methods and data structures to do these different operations all throughout the source code. It becomes unwieldy and difficult to tell at a glance what operations are provided, where to go to look to extend them and enhance them and uh, to, to debug them and so on. We also, as always, want to be able to ensure consistent and simple memory management, which is important in languages like C, where you don't have automated garbage collection. So what's the solution we're going to do? We're going to end up encapsulating operations with commands. And each command is an object that encapsulates certain kinds of operations. We'll have the execute method, which is used to run the operation. We can also have an unexecute method, which takes whatever the operation that executed it did and runs the inverse and undoes it. We can also have a method to test to see whether a particular uh, command is, is even reversible. And naturally, we'll also have to keep track of some state corresponding to what it is that the command is doing and what it's operating upon. There's a number of different ways to, to implement this particular kind of approach. Uh, one approach, which is often used if you're starting up front with a new design using the command-like approach, is to have the command execute method do the work itself directly. That's one way to do things. Another way of doing things, which is often what you do if you're taking some legacy code that was developed without thinking about some kind of centralized command model, and you have the command's execute method actually forward to a number of other objects in order to do the work, which may be a bit scattered throughout the code. As always, throughout all our designs in this module, we're using the bridge pattern to mediate access to the, the underlying command structure. This allows us to be able to handle variability in a more consistent way, and it also simplifies memory management in C++. So here is the expression tree command class interface. And this is the interface for defining a command that, when you execute it, will end up performing an operation of some sort on the expression tree. If you take a look at the interface, you'll see a couple things. Uh, first of all, this class plays the role of the abstraction in the bridge pattern. So it provides an interface that is what the outside world sees, what the client sees. And then there's a number of methods, like execute and unexecute, which can be used to forward 
to the underlying implementation, which we'll talk about next. Uh, it's also worth pointing out that this particular case study doesn't actually use unexecute, but many uses of command do in fact use unexecute in order to be able to do undo and redo operations. From a commonality and variability point of view, this command interface provides a way to be able to have a single means to access commands on the expression tree. From a variability point of view, as we'll see, this interface can delegate to different implementations that handle different kinds of commands in a common way. We next talk about the expression tree command implementation class, or ET command impl. Uh, this basically plays the base class role in an implementer hierarchy using the bridge pattern. So this is actually where the commands will, will be executed when they inherit from this interface. <clears throat> in this particular case, uh, this is playing the implementer hierarchy portion of the bridge pattern. And the bulk of the work is done in the execute method of the subclasses of this base class. Once again, from a commonality and variability point of view, this provides a common base class that's used to hold together the hierarchy of implementers for commands. And you then subclass from this particular interface and fill in the various pieces to do your work. The way in which we arrange these particular pieces of code corresponds nicely to a gang of four pattern called command. Uh, I'll mention a little bit later that there's another pattern from the POSA 1 book called the command processor pattern that has a lot in common with, with command. The intent of the command pattern is to be able to encapsulate the request for a service within the confines of a single object. You typically would use this particular pattern if you want to be able to parameterize objects in your program with actions they should perform under various conditions. Uh, for example, if you're building some kind of menu-driven user interface, you might implement the various menu selections as commands that, when selected, will go ahead and run the appropriate command to open, close, save, save as, and so on. You might also want to use this pattern if there's a need to specify, queue, and then execute the commands at some later point in time. And this, in some sense, is where this pattern has a lot in common with the command processor pattern from the POSA 1 book. That pattern talks a lot more about queuing up the commands and being able to dispatch them, potentially in a separate thread of control, at some later point in time. You can also use this pattern for multi-level undo and redo, where you could have sequences of redo operations or undo operations that you could run backwards and forwards, taking things on and off of some kind of history list of commands to execute and unexecute. The diagram at the bottom of the slide illustrates a common way of structuring the pieces for this pattern. As you can see, you have some kind of invoker, and it goes ahead and executes a command. And that command would typically then delegate to some concrete command that actually performs the operation on a target to perform an action of some kind. In our particular example, the ET command impl base class plays the role of the command uh, class here. And then we can go ahead and have different kinds of commands. We can have print command, expert command, quit command, macro command, eval command, and so on and so forth that inherit from the command impl and then flesh out different types of behaviors when their execute methods are called from the bridge interface portion. Here's a small example of applying the command pattern in the context of our expression tree processing application. Uh, we're going to show an example of something called a macro command, which is used to encapsulate the execution of a group of commands as a single object. What this ends up doing, you can use this when you're running in so-called succinct mode. And you have a vector of commands that you want to execute as a macro. And we'll, we'll take a look at more detail about how these different things work in just a minute. Uh, what you do here when you're running in, in succinct mode is you type an expression in, and then that ends up being put into a so-called macro command. And that macro command, when run, will go through a sequence of other commands to be able to figure out the format that you want to treat the input as, take the input expression and turn it into an expression tree, and then be able to evaluate that expression tree in some order to get a result. So that's the succinct way of doing things. As you can see in this particular example, we're illustrating the use of the STL for each algorithm to start at the beginning of the set of macro commands and go through each one and invoke the execute member function on each element in that particular range in the vector. Uh, this turns out to use an interesting feature from 
STL and C++ called the MemFunRef adapter. And this is a way of basically being able to take something that's meant to be used for uh, functors and then be able to pass pointers to member functions to that particular use in the for each algorithm. This also illustrates the adapter pattern. So for each doesn't really understand the concept of member functions, it understands functors, and the memfunref adapter converts a pointer to a member function into something that can be used in a way that the for each algorithm expects to be uh, a functor. The adapter pattern is another gang of four pattern. We're not going to talk a lot about it here. I just want to mention it in passing. The basic intent of the adapter pattern is to be able to allow classes or objects or portions of software to work together when they weren't intentionally designed to work together. So this is a good example of how we can adapt things using the adapter. If you travel overseas, uh, you have run into the adapter pattern anytime you had to figure out how to plug your computer or your phone into a different type of wall socket. And people sell hardware adapters at airports and travel stores. You can use to do that adaptation. There are other ways of being able to, to do this type of processing that don't use the adapter pattern per se. For example, the C++11 Lambda expressions gives you another way of being able to pass in some anonymous code, a little anonymous function, into the third parameter to for each. So this is another way of being able to use the uh, for each algorithm to dispatch the appropriate execute method on the commands. <clears throat> we can also go ahead and use the C++ range-based for loop to be able to go ahead and, and execute the various uh, methods directly by using the mechanisms available in C++11 to iterate automatically through a container that has a begin and an end uh, factory operation under the hood. So these are just giving you an illustration that there are various ways of being able to carry out this particular implementation. So what are the consequences? What are some of the issues of using command? It helps to abstract the execution of a service. It allows you to be able to queue up these commands to execute them later. It allows you to be able to queue them up in order to be able to put them on a history list to undo them and redo them. Uh, you can also create macro commands quite easily out of individual commands, as we showed here in our example. There are some downsides, of course. You can end up with lots and lots of command subclasses if you have a complicated set of commands you're trying to support. And while that's not inherently bad, it may be a little bit unsettling to application developers or maintenance developers who may not be accustomed to seeing such a large number of classes, each of which do very trivial things. So knowledge of the pattern helps to explain why the design looks like that. Uh, you can also, of course, end up using an excessive amount of memory to support undo and redo operations. Some of the implementation concerns, uh, copying the command or copying the state that the command depends on before you put it into a history list so that you make sure you got that state if you take it off the history list to undo it or redo it later. There's a number of issues that are surrounded that dealing with something called hysteresis, which is basically an issue of avoiding accumulating a set of errors if you do many undos and redos and you don't take care to keep all that state in a consistent storage location and keep track of all the state that the commands depend on. You can start to lose things and start to have errors that build up over time. Another issue about implementation, how transactional do you want your commands to be? If uh, you have a sequence of commands and you undo something and redo something and your program crashes, what level of heroics do you want to go to to make sure it's still in the same state when it comes back up again? Uh, obviously, for very mission critical applications, you want things to be truly transactional in the, the ACID property database sense. For other situations, you may not want to spend as much overhead trying to do persistable store to disk locations that are going to be logged in case they have to be rolled back at some point. There's a number of different known uses. A lot of windowing toolkits have this particular capability to support operations like menu operations. There's use of these kinds of things in various tools like Microsoft Word, where you can undo things and redo things. There's support for this in Emacs, where you can undo and redo things to various great levels. And uh, many other types of toolkits work this way, too. You might also want to take a look at the command processor pattern from the POSA 1 book, which has many things in common with the Gang of Four command pattern, but goes a little bit further in being able to, to designate how to do the queuing, how to handle persistence, how to handle concurrency, and so on and so forth. The next topic we're going to discuss 
is related to what we just talked about with respect to commands, but then generalizes beyond that to other types of issues we deal with in our expression tree processing application. Here's the particular situation. When you start creating many different kinds of related subclasses, like our command implementer hierarchy, or our hierarchy of iterators that we had before for the various traversal orders, you have to think carefully about how you're going to create these kinds of things and how you're going to make it possible to keep track of what makes sense to create and how you're going to be able to make it easy to add new capabilities and new extensions, new commands, new iterator traversal orders and so on in the future. Naturally, we'd like to do it in a way where we don't have to go and recode existing clients as we add new things. And we'd also potentially like to be able to add new capabilities without having to recompile our existing clients. We'd like to be able to do it without breaking binary compatibility to go even further. So how might we go about doing this? Well, the particular solution we're going to apply here is to abstract object creation. So instead of writing et command, command, new print command, where we go ahead and hard code a lexical dependency on a particular command subclass, like print command. Instead, we're going to change things to use a command factory that has a factory method called make command, where we pass in a string that says what command we want made. One of the nice things about doing this is there's no lexical dependencies exposed to the clients for the specific concrete subclass that we're trying to use. Here's an illustration of the structure of this particular approach we're going to do. We're going to have a command factory bridge abstraction interface, and that's going to go ahead and forward to the hierarchy of different kinds of concrete command factories that we might implement from a, inherit from a base class, using the bridge pattern as always to simplify access to variabilities and to be able to deal with various kinds of memory management issues in C++. Here is the expression tree command factory class interface. This is the interface that's used to create appropriate commands based on strings provided by the users. And there's a number of interesting variations we'll talk about here that are kind of fun. Uh, this is the, the bridge patterns abstraction role defining an abstract interface. And then we go ahead and define the main factory method, which is called make command, which is given a string for the kind of command to make. And then we have a set of helper factory methods that create the various types of specific commands, things like the quit command, the print command, the eval command, the macro command, and so on and so forth. From a commonality and variability point of view, we have a common interface with a common method called make command. And then it's possible to be able to make different kinds of implementations of commands in a way that does not expose the details to the callers. All they get back is the et command object, which is the abstraction part of the bridge pattern. Here's the expression tree command factory implementation class, or the et command factory impl class. This is the base class of the implementer hierarchy that's used to make different types of commands, depending on the kinds of inputs that are given by the application, by the program. This is the, the implementer portion that we'd have in the bridge pattern. We have a number of pure virtual methods here for making commands and making the various kinds of commands. And once again, common interface that we use to be able to make a range of different variabilities in a common way, part of our commonality and variability analysis. Here's a picture that illustrates how this all plays out. As you can see here, we end up with some parallel hierarchies. We've got the command factory hierarchy, and then we have the command hierarchy. Not surprisingly, the command factory is used to create the various kinds of commands. And as you can see here, each of the various factory methods we have in the command factory is responsible for creating the corresponding type of subclass of the command implementation hierarchy. So the expression uh, command, the expert command, is, is created by the make expert command factory method. The print command is created by the make print command method, and so on. And all these things are rolled up and accessed via the make command method. The bridge pattern is used as always. This particular way of arranging the software and the class pieces is the Gang of Fours factory method pattern, which is a class creational pattern. The intent of this pattern is to provide an interface for creating an object, but leave the choice of the object's concrete type to the subclass. And you would typically end up using this particular pattern when a class cannot anticipate ahead of time the objects it has to create. It just knows the base class of objects it creates. 
or if the class wants to allow subclasses to override its default choice. Here's an illustration of the actual structure of the pattern shown at the bottom half of the slide. In this case, we have a creator class, which defines a factory method. And this factory method returns a base class instance called a product. To use the factory method pattern, you inherit from creator to make a concrete creator, and you inherit from product to make a concrete product. And then the concrete creator's factory method creates the appropriate concrete product, but returns it as a pointer or a reference to the product, which is the base class of the concrete product. And this uses the very fundamental concept in object-oriented design and programming that you can access pointers to derived classes instances through pointers to base class instances or references to base class instances. In our example of expression tree processing, the et command impl would be the type of product we're dealing with. The et command factory impl would be the particular portion of the factory method, the creator class with a factory method that knows how to make the various types of commands. You have different kinds of concrete products. You have different types of concrete command factories. And these work together in a way we'll talk in more detail about in a moment in order to create the right kind of concrete object for the context in which it's being used. Here's an example of how we might do this in order to be able to create a command and let the subclass choose the concrete type. In this case, we're going to show the implementation of the make macro command we looked at previously when we talked about the command pattern. This is, of course, implemented as a pure virtual method in the command factory impl. And what you would do is come along and subclass from et command factory impl to make some concrete command factory. And we would fill out the details of what was needed to make the appropriate macro command. What we're going to do here is use this to implement the succinct mode, as I mentioned before. And we're then going to create a vector of commands that we can execute as a macro. And this will involve putting into our vector the format command for in-order processing, the expression that was passed in as a string, and we'll make an expression tree out of that using a make expression or make expert command. And then finally, we'll make a make eval command that will say to the system later, evaluate this expression tree in post order, return a result that we can then go ahead and display. This vector of commands is then stuck into an et command object, which is the bridge abstraction role, and passed back as the result of this make macro command method, which then gets passed back to the user. Some of the consequences of using this particular pattern, the client becomes a lot more flexible because you're not binding it to particular lexical dependencies on subclasses. Uh, and the details in which how things are created, you can leave those as a late binding decision, in fact. You can even do this dynamically at runtime. You're more decoupled. You don't have to know the details of how things work. The downside is you end up with more classes, and you have to use subclassing. And that just means you have to understand the pattern and when to apply it to understand the design that you're looking at or maintaining. There's a number of implementation considerations you should think about when you use this pattern. There are two basic choices. Either the creator class is an abstract class, and you must implement the factory methods, or the creator class is not an abstract class, and it provides a default implementation of the factory method, and you're potentially able, if you choose, to override and customize the way things work. Also, another way to do this is to have the factory method take a parameter, such as a string, and then use this to dictate the kind of command it actually makes. We, we had shown that when we illustrated the make command method we had, where you pass a string in, and then it figures out how to make the appropriate type of command based on what's in the string. There's many different known uses of this pattern. Lots of user interface toolkits work this way. Um, some smartphone frameworks work this way. We use this particular pattern throughout our implementation of, of CORBA because it helps us defer certain choices about how we make strategies and so on. And we typically use these things in conjunction with what we're about to talk about. What we're about to talk about now is actually a combination of factory methods into yet another pattern called the abstract factory pattern. And this is another gang of four pattern. It's an object creational pattern. And the purpose of this pattern is to create families of related operations or objects without specifying their subclass names, which is basically what factory method is doing. But abstract factory is going one step further to allow us to create groups of commands without 
exposing the subclass names. The diagram to illustrate this is somewhat complicated, but it's really just a pair of inheritance hierarchies that work together, that co-evolve. In one part, we have the abstract factory interface, which contains a group of factory methods. And each of these factory methods creates a product. And each of those products themselves are base classes that are capable of being subclassed. And then when you subclass your abstract factory to make concrete factories, each of the factory methods there will create the corresponding subclass corresponding to the type of product that they return. It's a lot of different moving parts, but if you sit around and think about abstract factory as a collection of factory methods, it gets a little bit easier to understand. We use this particular pattern when we do our expression tree command creation. You have the ET command factory implementation base class, which can then be subclassed. This returns various ET command impuls. And then you can subclass the abstract factory class to make a concrete factory class. And its various factory methods return the appropriate types of concrete commands, eval command, print command, quit command, macro command, and so on and so forth. So for every different kind of command we create, we have a, a, a factory method in our concrete factory that knows how to create that command. And we can do the very same kind of thing with our iterators for different traversal strategies as well. Here's a very simple example of how we can do this in the context of our expression tree processing application. Uh, what we're doing here is kind of clever. We're making an STL map, which is a data structure that maps keys to data. In this case, we're mapping strings to pointers to member functions that correspond to the various factory methods that know how to make each different kind of command. In the constructor for this particular uh, class, we go ahead and we insert into the command map strings for each different kind of command, and then the pointer to function, pointer to member function that corresponds to each of these different strings. So we put in the pointer to member function that knows how to make a format command, a print command, a quit command, and so on. And then we look down here at make command, which is the main entry point into this particular factory that we're developing. And make command turns around and looks at the input it gets, extracts out the command portion, the name portion, looks up in the map using the find operation, finds the appropriate iterator to that element that corresponds to the name we just looked up. And then it takes its second parameter, which is the pointer to member function, and it goes ahead and it invokes that using pointer to member function syntax, passing in the command parameter or parameters that go along with that particular command. So the nice thing about this is it's kind of table driven. You can add new commands without having to change much code. It's all very simple, very efficient. It uses the map mechanisms in C++ and, and therefore is never more than log n time to do any of the operations because it's implemented under the hood as a red black tree. The map itself, as you can see, is what keeps these things coordinated together. And we use the dispatching mechanism through pointers to member functions in order to carry out the actual delegation to the right factory method to do the job. Some of the consequences of abstract factory, it's very flexible. It, it goes even further than factory method does to remove the dependencies, the lexical dependencies on subclass names, but does it for a range of different kinds of objects that, or products you're creating. You can also use abstract factory carefully to ensure that there's no <clears throat> mistaken semantic incompatibilities between different kinds of things you're creating. For example, if you were creating some kind of window system, you might want to make sure that all the different widgets you were making had a consistent look and feel. And you could use the, the abstract factory pattern to make sure that everything you created had the right look and feel. There, of course, are some complexity issues. You end up with these dual hierarchies. There's lots of classes. And if you don't understand the pattern, it can be daunting because the surface area at first glance appears large to end users and programmers. Some of the implementation concerns, you can parameterize certain things in order to try to reduce the surface area. You'll notice how we used the, the make command method, took a string, so we didn't have to have quite as many things exposed to the outside world. You could pass it through a single interface. You might also consider the use of the prototype pattern that we talked about before in order to determine who creates the factories. You could use prototypes to select that. And it's also important to keep in mind that a, an abstract factory is really just a collection of factory methods. So once you understand one, it's pretty easy to understand the other. There's many node uses. Many window kits work this way. Interviews, ET++, uh, AWT has mechanisms like this in early versions of Java. 
And the ACE orb that we've developed uses this pattern extensively to make the right kinds of strategies for internal orb object request broker mechanisms for concurrency, synchronization, transport protocols, event demultiplexing, dispatching, and so on. So to summarize this particular group of patterns, we talked about using abstract factory containing a bunch of factory methods that create command objects. And then these command objects are used to dictate how users interact with the expression tree and the various operations they perform on the expression tree internal state and so on. These patterns are very useful to be able to extend things in very common ways. So we can go ahead and add new different kinds of operations, new different kinds of commands in a very stylized sense. It's always clear exactly where things go. The surface area is contained. There's never a mystery about where you put new things. So it makes your software much easier to understand, much easier to evolve, much easier to explain to people who come after you have developed it.